Hey, everybody. Glad to uh, be back again. It's a really nice, sunny, warm afternoon in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm looking forward to doing some things today that are going to take a little concentration and uh, take you down a journey of some places you might not have been before. And last time we did some compositing, we were doing dealing with strictly just sort of bringing images in and just using you know a little masking and working with our blend modes. Today we're going to take a look at some different stuff. I'd like to just first look at some images. Um, I always have a few pictures ready to go here just to talk to you. And um, I've been, a, like I said, commercial photographer here in Atlanta 30 years. Uh, the last uh, 18 of them have been completely digital capture now. So I've been actually a digital photographer longer than I have been a film photographer, uh, which is really, I never thought I would actually say that. Um, I like to use uh, digital photography and the composition to really assemble my images. I shoot everything in elements. I don't care how it's a single shot or if, it, you know, if it's a single shot of just one or two elements or if it's dozens and dozens of things, I still shoot it in pieces, even the single shots, because I can put the best pieces of things together. Uh, whether it's an illustration, these are some things I did for the Atlanta Opera, uh, Atlanta Magazine uh, magazine cover and also a Photoshop user cover uh, where you're shooting uh, you know, individual backgrounds and things. We're going to do a thing today called this place it mapping. We're not going to work on this shot. We're going to do the, fire, the brick, hands of brick today. Uh, and possibly another one if we have time, but we're going to do what's called displacement mapping. That's where we take an image and we actually wrap it around and tattoo it into another image. And it becomes almost the best parts of both images come together, the texture, the lighting. So the only way I really call it is, a, is almost a tattooing effect. And uh, it does take a, it, it's a very simple process once you see how it's done, but it takes a very specific set of blend modes to make things work. And uh, we're going to really work on that. I'm just going to run through a couple shots here. These are just some different montages that I do. All sometimes just one or two elements together. Sometimes it could be five or six elements together. And some of them are done for just pure art sake to keep practicing. And others are done for a lot of what I call prototyping client project, uh, client uh, new, uh, new product we're bringing to market. This is another. This is a really good good example of what I call displacement mapping. The the uh, skull the uh, mannequin with the circuit board and I do have a, a complete step-by-step -step notes on how to do this one that I'm going to give to you at the very end for the download so don't feel like you got to sit down and write this down what I'm going to give you at the end is a download PDF address where you're going to download the notes because the blend modes and the order of the blend modes I'd rather you watch it than actually try to write so much stuff down because you know I, my nickname out on the speaking circuit is fast talking, non breathing, caffeinated man. And I tend, as I get rolling, I will really start to, uh, to get going. This is, of course, the one we did last time. Um, let us bring up the images that we're going to work on. So I've got a folder of images that I've set aside. And these are some things that we are going to merge together and create one photograph. Now, to start with, I just should say, I'm just looking at this, I shot some shots of my assistant's hands against some black felt. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted, so I shot them all different kinds of ways. Uh, you know, fingers together, fingers separate, just all different ways, just to show you what kind of uh, shots until I got them together and tried it. And this, of course, right here, I'll just pull this up for a second. This is the shot that I ended up with that we're going to use for the basic. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a cool background shot. We're going to be using primarily photo tools and uh, uh, photo frame from, from some of the on one plugins to do some of the creative effects and we are going to take it piece by piece to show and there's a lot of little teeny lessons involved here so there's not just about the displacement mapping there's a lot of little cool things that we're going to work through and what we're going to do is we're going to take this shot of some bricks right here and we're going to wrap these bricks around those hands as if those hands are made of bricks which means I want to see all the lights and darks and textures right down to the fingerprints on those fingers that are embedded right into that brick and those bricks are going to have to curve around those fingers and that's where there's two parts of this one is displacement mapping and one is a series of blend modes that bring the two images together. So as always, I always want to start out with a background image. So we're going to use this one and I have this, these chains. Now, of course, I shot these months earlier, didn't know exactly what I was going to do with them. I was walking down a pier in Homer, Alaska, and I saw all these machines and rusty chains and things, and I just shot them, and it didn't come to me for six months what exactly to do with this. 
So I've got a nice background shot, but let's take it a step farther and we're going to do some enhancing to this. So I'm going to open my library of On One software and we're going to go in, right into photo tools and we're going to bring up a couple different things. So first thing I decide, I'd like to have this before and after after so I can kind of get a feel if I'm taking something in the right direction as I apply effects because I stack these effects very much like I stack layers and blend modes and stuff in my Photoshop layers. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we're going to go to the photo filter and I think red because of the red bricks we're going to have a problem with too much red so I want to go ahead and add some blue to this. So I've just sort of taken and given this whole thing kind of like a cool blue filter. The next thing I want to do is I was playing around with this earlier and never do it the same way twice. So I'm kind of was playing around earlier and I came up with uh, some of the things that were in the HDR enhancer. One of them I liked was the golden hour enhancer. So I'm going to stack that on top of it, which is going to boof. It's got some nice cool some tones in there, and I like these little purple or blue tones, and it's getting kind of cool here. Then I went down here and I gave it a little bit of a grunge. We can see up here on the far right corner up here, we can see our stacks of effects on top of the original. I can of course watch the visibility of them and uh, fade. If I don't like so much grunge I can sort of fade that in and out but I'm going to keep that right there. And then I was playing around. Don't exactly know what this is here but it looked cool so I tried it and I like it I think. Let's see. It got a little dark but I like this part. We're going to open this up. I like the, the denseness of it. So with all that in mind we're going to say apply so we see now this image is having these different tools and different effects applied. It's going to come in as its own layer. You can see them building over here in the layers panel as we go along. It's coming along with a bunch of different things here. And when it's all said and done, it's, a, it's a dark, but it's got the grunginess feel that I want of this. You can see there's my original one and there's my darker one. Now, I'm going to say that I like the look of it, but it's a little too dark. What's the first thing you think to do? Oh. I'm going to go to levels. Well, levels isn't exactly the right way because levels will in, in, in turn increase contrast. So I try, the first place I always do is use a screen blend mode. So all we do is take the existing layer. Just forget this one's even here. That's just our background one to refer to later to see where we've been. Let me close this off here and let me go to full screen here. So I'll take this layer here and I'm going to drag it down to the new layer icon, the layers panel, and I'll just change the blend mode to screen. That way I can change the opacity, I can take it down in any amount as I bring this up, 30%, 40%, about 75% of, of itself in a screen blend mode is about like opening up one f-stop on your camera lens. So we've got a little more, a little more oomph to it. If we needed more, I could just increase that by du duplicating it again and again. So here I'm liking the look of this from where we were. I've got three different levels of that. I'm going to hold my option key, alt in the PC for a second. And you can see the difference between here, there's where we were before we started, and here's with this nice enhancement, and I like that. So let's take, keep that separate for a second. I'll make that a layer, keep it separate. And I'm going to merge these down into one visible layer because I like this effect. So I'll just say here, merge, or, or uh, sorry, what does it need to do? Merge visible? Can't do merge visible because I'm on the, I gotta be on the layers. Hold on. There we go. Merge visible. Now, I've got this down to one layer. I'm going to do a separate technique that I call giving your shot the treatment. We talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, we're going to just take the image, we'll drag it down, we'll have two of them. Now, I'm going to take this one here and I want to make that the active on top and I'm going to change the blend mode to darken. Now, you won't see anything happen at first. Uh, if I want to make sure and give myself some real extra flexibility, I would make this into a smart filter. So let's do that. Convert to smart filter. And now this allows me to say when I apply a filter, I can go back, take the effect on, take the effect off if I feel like it's too much after I come back the next day or after I've walked away from it. You've got a, the ability to not have to start from the beginning again. So I will go up here to Filter, Blur, and I use my Gaussian Blur. And you can see right here, I'm going to put this right in the center, you can see from nothing here as I blur the image here, you can see it's totally blurred, but in the photograph, you can see some really interesting things happening here. It's got this sort of cool illustrative look. Now if you go too far, it gets wacky. If you don't go far enough, you don't do it. So it's more of a visual. I can't say what the number is. It's all about what looks good. That's a little too much. I'm going to come back a little bit. So in this case, we're going to say about 10, 10, 11 is going to be our number. Hit OK. 
and we'll just try that before and after. There's before, there's after. So I'm starting to get the feel of this background. This is going to be my anchor image. Now we can uh, always, if uh, you can see later, if I have to go back on this file after it was already saved, I can always click on that again and make a slight change to those numbers again. So with that in mind, let's say we're going to save that one and we'll save that as change PSD to the desktop and put that away because we want to go ahead and flatten this one down and we're going to take it into back into some on one tools one more time. This time, you can see here, uh, I'll just look again, the before and after. Here's the before. It's okay, but it's kind of blasé after. I mean, it's almost like a cool little work of art all by itself. Let's take this and flatten this down to one image. So our background, this is still our background image. Let's try another on one thing. I'm going to go to on one photo frame. We'll open that up. It's going to build my library. And I'm going to go to, I've kind of played around a little while before we started, just picking whatever the edge I felt was good today. And I found this one under clean inner edge. I like this one right down here at the bottom called number two. So I'm going to double click on that. And this image comes in as a surrounding image. Now, I'm not going to use it like that. I'm going to take my cursor and hold it over the normal. And I can see exactly what would happen with different blend modes. I'm not applying them yet. I'm just trying some different blend modes. And I can see that I kind of like this look of either multiply or overlay. I think the overlay I'm liking a little better. And soft light, I don't like what it's doing to the background. Exclusion is kind of weird. This would be okay for certain kinds of things, but we're going to go with multiply. So hit multiply with that one. You can see up here is my, my, uh, my actual frame layers. And on top of the original shot, I hit apply. And it's going to take a couple seconds. This is a good processing intensive type software and it's amazing how many things it's going to have to go through to give me the effect. You'll actually see some things happening to the file as it's going to build a layer down. We'll see here in the layers eventually we'll have a layer and here's our shot. Okay, so there we go. We did that pretty good. So you can see before. Now I purposely wanted this kind of look to have like a frame inside a frame. Now I can actually do some things here where I can multiply the image and do some things and change the blend modes again. There's nothing, no reason why I can't go over here and say darken or, or, or multiply and get some different effects. Now this is kind of what I was looking for. It's a little bit of a frame inside of a frame and I can actually play with that a little bit if I want to lighten it a little bit. Uh, a lot of times I will use and just be in the move tool and I will do shift plus, shift plus, shift plus and I'll just go through some blend modes. Let's see if I can see anything. Like I like that one. That's kind of overlay, soft light. I kind of like that soft light. What would happen if I doubled it up and made two of them? Makes it even deeper. I don't like that. Command Z. So it's an experimental process, but that looks to me about where I want to be for my background image. Hey, Jim. Okay. Yes. Uh, would you mind just, um, I guess there's a little bit of a lag between your narration and the video. So if you could just uh, slow down just slow down. a bit, I think. Slow down. <laughs> Over caffeinate. No. Okay, I've got so much to do. I'm sorry. I'm going too fast. So I will go a little slower and let the video make sure I'm on the right tools. I'm going here. Um, Thanks a lot. Okay. Great. Sorry. Thank you. I'm gonna keep people have to remind me. Sometimes you'll have to just once in a while, like say, Jim, breathe, take a breath. Okay. Um, the next thing we do is we'll just we'll just put this aside for a minute and we're gonna start with our other image. This is the cool, tricky part of what we call displacement mapping. So let's do this. We are going to open our hands. Now the first thing we're going to do is change this to a black and white image. And where else better to do that than go right back into Photo Tools to do that. So we'll go to Photo Tools and pick one of their black and white enhancers here. And I believe we're going to go black and white treatments. And I like this one that was way down here at the bottom. Uh, it says Mac G black and white. I was reading the thing. It was a, for based on a Greg Gorman duotone. And I'm going to hit uh, a, um, let's see if I double click it. It's going to apply it. I'm looking for something really gritty and sparkly and make the hands really gritty here for the effect. So again, lights and darks are cool. I'm going to hit apply. So I've got my black and white image coming in here. You can see the pieces coming in. And at the end, I need to flatten this down to one layer. So we'll say, flattened image. So we've got a nice flat black and white image. If for any, this is the image that is going to be used for us to actually 
uh, create the displacement mapping. It is going to be a black and white, slightly out of focus image of lights and darks that will tell the bricks exactly how to bend. And I'll explain that more coming up. Now, if you feel like you're not getting the right look and the right lights and darks, I would do a little burning and dodging. But for me, I always want to do it as a adjustable layer. So let's add a burn and dodge layer. The burn and dodge tools have gotten a lot better over the years, but one thing I don't particularly care for is the fact that I still have to choose between highlights, midtones, and shadows when I want to do burning and dodging. I don't want to burn and dodge like that. I want to burn and dodge like I did in the dark room many, many years ago. And that means if I want to burn and dodge, it's sort of an equal effect across the board. So what I'm going to do instead is create a new layer. I'm going to go down to my new layer icon down here in the layers panel. Now if I just click that icon with new layer, all you get, boom, is a blank layer. That's not what I want. Command Z that. What I'm going to do instead is hold down my Option key or my Alt key on the PC and I will click the new layer icon in which then I get a new layer icon dialog box that will ask me some questions. And one of the things it can ask me is, what kind of blend mode do you want? And you see this little line down here that says no neutral color exists for normal mode. But as I go into different modes such as darken mode, this message changes. Fill with dark and neutral color white. If I go into the light and blend modes, it'll say, oh, changed again. Fill with light and neutral color black. And if I go into the overlay blend modes, it will say, oh, fill with gray. Now what this means here, if I check this, when I hit the new layer, you'll watch here in the layers panel, I will get a gray layer. Now what is that layer? Why is that layer not doing anything? Well, that's because in an overlay blend mode, the gray is totally invisible. If I turned off that bottom layer, you'd see that we are exactly a zone 5, F, uh, 128 uh, gray. But with this blend mode, it, we are completely inv uh, basically invisible. The cool thing here is anything darker than this gray will darken the underlying layers very much more and very much more like how we burned in the dark room. Anything we paint with white will then lighten the underlying layers. So I'm going to grab a paintbrush. I'm going to hit my default colors of black and white. I'm going to go to normal. And I'm going to look at my paint brushes to see my brushes that I have a nice clean brush. I do not want to have a brush that starts out with a small point and then gets fatter. I want them to be the same uh, spread all the time and I want to choose my opacity and the flow up here. So I want to be 100% opacity and a very, very low flow and I'm going to paint with black. I'm going to use my bracket key to make my brush a little bigger and I'm going to start painting with black. I'm going to bring this down a little bit and I'm going to do this kind of quickly but what I'm doing here is I'm trying to round off the image a little bit and you notice that whether it's a highlight or a shadow it doesn't make much difference. It's going to darken the image down very much like you would burn and dodge in the dark room. So I'm going to darken that down now I'm going to make my brush smaller by using my bracket key and I'm going to come around here and I just want to darken around the fingers a little bit because by doing that you'll see in just a minute why the lights and the darks of these hands uh, are going to tell the bricks how to bend. Now when things are lighter they're going to bend one direction and when they're darker they bend another. So if I want to lighten something I will go and do with white maybe I'll come in here I know this is going to look weird as a photograph but trust me it's going to be very good for our, our what we need to do. I'm going to lighten all the hands and fingers. I'm going to come in here. You can see I've got a lot of nice crevices in here. I may come down here and lighten this to make it bend a little bit more in here. And that's all I need. Now, what does that really look like? It's probably kind of strange looking. You can see it is the gray area means that nothing happens to the photograph. The darker areas are darkening the underlining pixels. The lighter areas lighten the under, underlining pixels. This will do a lot. I don't know. You can see it just change. You can see that changing. And of course, on a normal thing, I could always just subtly change that. I could blur it to make it more subtle. A lot of things. Once I'm happy with that nice black and white, I'm going to merge that down. I'll come around here. We're going to go ahead and flatten the image. I'm under a layers panel. I'll come down here and flatten the image down. And now I will uh, save this. A very important part before we save it is to blur it before we save it. Uh, I remember once I did this, forgot to blur it, and the image breaks apart instead of bend. So it's a very important little secret thing. You've got to go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. I don't need to make this a smart filter because I'm just going to blur it once. Now, how much do we blur it? Okay, if, when it's sharp, it breaks up, and if it's this blurry, it's going to be not going to do what it needs to do either. So I'm saying you just want to make it look like you're slightly out of focus, kind of like that, kind of like a Monday morning after a heavy 
weekend of partying, that kind of vision, you know, look, look, look. So just everything's just a little bit fuzzy. Okay, that's we good. We say okay. Now we have this blurry image. It's black and white. I must save this. Save as a Photoshop native file. So we're going to save this to the uh, to the desktop, and we are going to save this not as a JPEG, but as a Photoshop. If it's not a PSD file, this process will not work. It's the only kind of file it'll see. So I hit save. Now this black and white, out of focus, contrasty shot is going to tell us how to bend our shot. So let's go ahead and get our hands out again. Now here are the hands that we are going to work with. Now we're going to get our brick. This is where it's supposed to get fun. We're going to get our bricks out. So here's our bricks. I'll just go to my move tool and I'm going to drag the bricks over to the hands and let that go. So I'll just keep that in here. I can close the bricks off now and we can close off these things and just make a couple things, make it a little easier for us to see. Let's close, let's close this off and we'll put this away for a bit because we don't need that quite yet. So here we have our image of the hands. If I bring this down to about 50%, you can see where our, our 60%, you can see our hands coming through there. Now, in order to give us a believability of perspective, we need to change something. Those hands are coming towards us. We're not, they're not moving, they're not straight up and down like this brick wall. So we want to cover that, we want to make sure we cover all of the hands with these bricks and I'm going to go into free transform so we'll do uh, edit and we'll go down here from transform I could do all these things individually but under free transform command T or control T on the PC will give me all the tools together so I've got my boundary box I can actually first of all holding my shift key and option and that would be shift and uh, alt on a PC I could actually just make it a little bit bigger and it's coming out from all four sides rather than one side at a time. Now I also say perspective is not right so I'm going to hold my command key and this would be your your control key on a PC and by adding the shift key to constrain proportions or not so sorry straight proportion to hold to a straight line I will be I will be able to pull this image out. Now watch holding command key or, or control on the PC add the shift I'm going to pull it out so that I'm actually going to stretch out the perspective on this to make these hands look like they're coming up uh, longer to us and I'm also going to have to pull up anytime we pull out we're gonna to have to pull up to make it like we were doing in a view camera so now we have this image a lot bigger than we need so I can hold my shift and my option that would be shift and alt on the PC hold the corner drag it in you can see it comes in from all four sides it's a lot easier to keep it where you need it and I do want to have an overlap I don't want think of it as like shrink wrapping we're going to shrink wrap the bricks to fit the hands and if I don't have enough outside of the thumbs and fingers it's it's going to shrink wrap about a, you know about 10 percent in and I'm not going to be able to get it it's just like you put it in the microwave oven under plastic and it shrinked right in there so that's where we want to be I'm going to hit enter and uh, we see that the bricks are in good place. If you went up to 100%, you can see the bricks are now in a nice perspective for us. So I'm going to leave it so you can see through here. Now, blow this up a little bit. This is where the really one of the cool parts. This is about the coolest part of it. How do we bend the fingers? What is this all about? And why do we make that black and white shot? We're going to go under the filter menu up here at the top of Photoshop. We're going to come down here and we're going to go to distort. And we're going to move over to displace. Now you think with something as complex as uh, bending, you know, uh, these images over another, that you're going to have this really. You have, guys, I guarantee you, 90% of you have never even been in this dialog box because you didn't really know what to do with it. So uh, it just seems to be something people just don't want to mess with. And you think this would be a really complex dialog box with lots of controls and previews and stuff. And you go here and you say displace, and this is it. This is the whole thing. We don't care anything about the stretch to fit or wrapping around because we're going to shrink wrap and cut off the edges anyway. So all we're looking for here is how far to scale it. Now what this says here is we are going to displace it a certain percentage horizontally and vertically. Now why you need, you need something to use as a guide to tell it and this is why people get a little crazy at this next point because you say okay I'm going to displace it and you go here and then it asks ask you for something else. It's saying choose a displace and map. It wants something to tell it how it can bend. So on the desktop we have Keith's hands PSD that we made so we're gonna say use this black and white photograph to tell it how to to bend. Anything that is sort of neutral normal 128 gray 
leave alone. Anything brighter than gray, I want you to bend the image up and to the right. Anything darker than 50% gray, I want you to bend it down to the left. So it's going to use the lights and the darks of Keith's hands black and white image to bend it. So when I hit when I click that picture, and you can only see things that are PSDs. If it was a JPEG or a TIFF, it would be grayed out. So that's the first problem people write to me and say, I was doing this image, but it's still grayed out. You gotta remember it's gotta be saved as a PSD. And sometimes we don't think about a single layered shot as a PSD, but this one has to be. Hit open and you'll watch in a couple seconds you'll see the image. Now this is not the whole effect, but you have to go command Z that a couple times. You can see how the image is bending around the hand. And you see it literally almost like it shrink wrapped down. Sometimes I will even do it twice. So if I if I wanted to do it again just to see if it bent more, I will hit the same filter and just I will undo this if I think it's too much. It's too much. Okay, so usually about 30-30 is a good starting point. Now, so well, that's okay. What the heck is that going to look like? Well, this this next is the trick with the blend modes. It's a three combination blend mode that I came up with many years. It's been documented in a lot of textbooks since then with my credit as to something that I've actually come up with here for prototyping textures and colors onto a subject. Now, you see the hands have flesh color and the bricks have the red color. I want to merge the, I want a little bit of both in there. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this, I'm, I'm right here at about, I'm going to say leave it at 50%. There's no right or wrong number, but I start at 50% and work my way up from there. So here at 50%, I'm going to ch change this layer blend mode from normal to multiply. That's the first step. So you have this image, you can start to see this thing. What happened is, because of the black, the multiply just basically ate the outside of the brick, so we don't even have to worry about pathing that out, but that's not good enough. Let's do another duplicate layer. So I've got a second layer above it. I'm going to change this second blend mode from multiply to overlay. And then I'm going to take this again, duplicate it one more time, and change the top blend mode from overlay to color. And now we're going to have the realistic. If we go in here right now, and the thing is, is you see the brick running around the finger. It's actually bending around the, the corners of the finger and so forth. But the most important part is it gets darker as you can, look, I can even see the fingerprints of the finger coming through. But as the finger gets darker, so does the bricks, so does the mortar. It gives it a very, very, very realistic effect and works with some things, doesn't work with everything, but it allows us to give this a feeling of these hands pretty much carved out of bricks. So the key thing to remember is if you start, it depends if you want to think from the top down or the bottom up. One of my students once came to me and said he think calls it the remembers it as the dot com effect because it's C for color, O for overlay, M for multiply, C O M. So on top, color, overlay, multiply. Now, how much opacity? If you gave it more multiply, you're going to see it get darker and more richer. If you give it more color, it's going to have more of the bricks. If you take off or add more overlay, you're going to get a more contrast or less contrasty. So we don't have an exact set of numbers, but 50-50-50 is a great starting point. Sometimes it's 40-60, sometimes it's 30-40-50, it's whatever, but 50-50-50, color on top, overlay in the middle, multiply in the bottom. So we have this, these hands, and we're going to leave it about there, which is probably take this down a little too dark. I like it right there. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and flatten this image. We, of course, save it as a layered image. If you wanted to work, uh, keep this layered, a great way to work would be to create a new blank layer with all these in it. I'll do my favorite keyboard shortcut on the Mac first, Command, Option, Shift, E. What that just did is makes a brand new layer, which takes all visible layers and paste it in there. The PC version of that would be Control-Alt-Shift-E. Make blank layer, look at all visible layers and blend modes and apply them to that layer without flattening the file. In this case, now we have a layer that we can bring over to the other picture uh, and still keep our, our, uh, our options open. So we're going to open up our chains now and let's bring our image over. Since this is now in one layer, Let's drag this guy over here and drag that layer onto my photograph. Uh, and let's get this guy put away. Let's just save him to the, again, back to the desktop in case we need it later. Replace. And here is my uh, hands. Now, the first 
two elements that we're going to kind of put together on top of those chains there. I'm going to hit my five key for just a second to go to 50% just to kind of make sure that I'm kind of scale where I want. I'm, the hands are a little too big, so I'll come back up to zero so I can see them. Command T or Control T will bring up where we had our free transform again right here, Command T or Control T. And I'm going to hold my Shift key to constrain proportions. I'm going to hold my Option key to keep it centered, and I'm going to bring those back in a little bit so these hands have a little room for some other elements in here. We'll come into about like right about in there. That's probably about where I want you to start. And of course, I can always come a little smaller later. Uh, I tend not to say, well, why don't I use it as a smart object? There's some things I can't do with smart objects, so I only use smart objects when I feel like there's a lot of going to make it big, make it small, make it big, make it small. I tend to otherwise just give myself a couple of options. I know I can always bring this element right back in again uh, if I need it. Now that I have this guy in place, I'm going to add a black layer mask because I've got to get rid of all this extra black stuff. I don't want to do a clipping path and sort of be an exact edge. I like a little bit of this black, as I'll show you. It'll come up like a shadow. So I'm going to hold down my Option key, and I'm going to click, and of course it's Alt key on the PC, and I'm going to click the new, um, I'm sorry, this has got to be on the top of the stack here. There we go. Uh, no, sorry, this, this layer's got to be up top here. Where is that? Let's do that below that. There we go. Let's see. That is, oh, I see, that's a whole layer. That's, I see, I see what the problem, I accidentally got this inside a layer. Something went wrong here when I did that. Um, I put it inside a layer. So let me, let me see where I made my mistake here. Get that, I've got to get that outside of that. There we go. Okay. There, now I'm back to where I need to be. Let's say that we're going to take this guy as part of our background here. Um, as we uh, get rid of it, we're going to keep that as an option because we're not sure how we'll keep that. Now here I'm on my layer. I'm on the top of the layer, keeping it very simple. We're only down to really three layers now. I'm going to hold my option key. Instead of just saying, here, click layer mask. Well, here, make sure it's active. Click layer mask and then paint off the black. I know the hands are in the right spot, so instead, I'd rather hold down the Option key or Alt key, click Layer Mask, makes Layer Mask filled with black, hides all the picture. We know the picture's in the right spot, we just, we just know it's hiding, so we make sure the mask is highlighted, we can see that the little black line is around the mask. I'll come here and I will pick a paintbrush. Now again, I will use a fairly wide brush. It's soft. We've already checked it before. And I'm going to paint with white because I'm on a black layer mask. And as I start to paint in here, you can see I'm starting. I'm going to just roughly paint the hands in a little overpainted first. And then I might take something back off. And as I bring the hands in, I'm leaving a little bit of that shadow in there. I don't want it to come in 100%. But I, want to, I, like, I like the little bit of that black because it makes it feel like the hands are now above the chains. It's just a hat, what I would consider a happy accident. Otherwise, I'd have to make a shadow. So I'm going to bring it in at 100%. No, I, what I, so my standard position, my standard operating procedure is going to be bring an element in, position it, check any of the blend modes or whatever you need to to make sure you're, you're happy with the way it's coming in, then hide it with the black layer mask, and then paint it again slowly to bring it in. Now, I can see here I've overpainted, so I'll use a smaller paintbrush and I'll go back to my black, and I'll start, I don't want, certainly don't want that edge there, and I'll start taking it off around here, and I want it to fade in nicely. I'll make the brush a little bit bigger and my flow a little slower, and I'll just start, I'm just sort of slowly bringing that guy off. It's a very subtle thing. If I think hey, I Jim? need more, yes? Can you discuss the differences between opacity and flow? There was a question yes. that came in, and I think it's a good, it's a valid one. Very good question. I, I, I find that uh, something that's very, very important stuff. Think of opacity of flow as this. A pa think of me as I'm working right now on my wa I'm working on a, on, a, on a Wacom Intuos 4 tablet. And I've got a lot of pressure variables inside the pen. The opacity is, think of this as an airbrush. And this airbrush is putting out pure ink. It's putting out, it's putting out uh, a blast of ink and how much ink can, can come out of the brush is the opacity. So if I have it set at 100%, if I hold this brush down, 100% of that ink will eventually come out. The flow is the airbrush constriction nozzle on the end of the brush, how fast it comes out. So if I have a full opacity and a very slow flow, eventually, the longer I hold it down, everything will come out. So watch, if I, if I have it on like 1%, 
is I'm painting, I'm painting it off right now, it's very, very slow. But if I have the flow up to like 100%, you can see how it's very, very quick and very harsh. So we want to be able to say, I find that it's easier to say, instead of having a low opacity and a high flow, I always, I mean, I, it's just the way I work, I've always worked this way, I always have opacity at 100% and flow very, very low. On a mouse, you would need about twice as much, but on a, on a Wacom tablet, you're going to need just a little bit, so like 10% goes a long way with my pressure. So I'm, here I'm going to use, right here is my foreground and background color, X key will ch change that, I'm just hitting X. X for black, X for black, D for default keys, and then X for uh, black or white. So if I want white, paint it in. I want black, paint it out. So I've got this back and forth, and I have total control, and I'm never, under any circumstances, I'm going to ever touch an eraser tool. There's no reason for it. It's not illegal. If I catch you using it, you're going to get a fine on your email. So don't be using the eraser tool. It's, there's no reason for it. The mask allows you to say what looks good today, may not always look so great tomorrow morning when you wake up and you still got the ability to just mask it in and mask it out. So always choose a layer mask. If I hold down my option key and click the layer mask, you can actually see what the mask looks like. If I say, oh, you know what, I need a little stuff maybe in the middle. If I option click it again, mask comes back. If I hold down my shift key, well, option, of course, that's alt in the PC. If I hold down my shift key and click the mask, you'll notice there's an X through the mask now and it disables the mask. So I can see exactly what the mask is letting me do. Sometimes I have to see the whole mask or the whole image. I might disable it for a second to find my place and mark it with a blue line or something and then go back again and start painting. So again, I'm going to hold my shift key and take that out. So I'm happy with the way that's looking. We have lots of other elements we need to bring in. So let's get back over to the bridge and see what we have to work with. Okay, I have real quickly a bunch of rusty things that I shot that I'm going to bring in as some other, other elements. So we'll just bring them in one at a time. Here is, got to get to a regular screen, here is some rusty, rusty things. So I'm going to take this, I'm just going to drag it over, and what I'm looking for, I'm going to just hit 50%, and it's obviously pretty big, so I'm going to do Command-T, hold my Shift key down, and slowly take it down a little smaller. Now what I'm looking for is little pieces of things like this, these little pieces of gears that kind of come in. So I'm not looking for the whole photograph, I'm looking for some interesting pieces. So I look at it at about 50%, I hit return, make sure I like where it is. Many times I will always go through the blend modes. In this case I can tell you the blend modes aren't going to do anything for me because I've done this demo many a time, but I always check them. So to check them, I'm in my move tool still, I will use the keyboard shortcut, shift plus, and shift minus to cycle through the blend modes. I don't have to hold this down and go through them all. Watch, if I just hold shift, I'm holding my shift and now my plus key down, you can see how it was just, you can see it just flying through all the blend modes. Uh, in this case, every one of these is a little bit different effect and I'm really looking at just this corner. So I'm saying, is there anything that really does it for me here with these other blend modes or not really doing what I want it to do? So I'm going to say that I'm going to leave it as a normal blend mode back to normal and there is normal where are you there's normal and I've got it in the position so once I'm in position hold my option or alt key click make sure we're highlighted click new layer mask black it out so I'm with white pick my soft paintbrush start to bring that in I'm just going to bring it in right where I need a little bit of this sort of curvature of this of this gear that's all I'm looking for is little pieces like that We'll close this off. We don't want that one now. So let's bring in at least two more. We'll bring in this guy right here. It's kind of cool. Same procedure. Again, real fast, we'll just bring it in. We'll look at it at about 50%. We find a, a part where those edges work. How about right into this corner? Right, I like this kind of corner right here. Go back to 100%. We've checked all the blend modes. We're happy with that. Hold down my Option key on the layer. The layer is highlighted. New layer mask. Click. I've got a black layer mask. Simple again. I'm just going to grab my white, my paintbrush. I'm with white. I'm going to start stroking that. I'm going to bring in those gears a little bit over, over the rusty chains. That's all I'm looking for is something like that. Let's find one more over here. Let's try this guy right here. We'll bring him over. Move tool. Drag it over. We can close this one off. We don't need this anymore. And we don't need this one anymore. 
and we'll hit the five key for 50 percent and I like this something about right in here coming down around the thumb let's try that so I hit zero for full effect back to 100 percent opacity hold down my option or alt key I'm on the right layer layer number four collect the new layer mask icon grab my brush again I'm still painting with white Maybe there's a little something down in here that I wanted to get. And I'm starting to feel good about that. Now, uh, next, I think we need one. Let's see, do we have another piece of rust? Uh, we're going to use this little piece right here. I can't, can't give it up. i got to gotta fix it up nice. So we got one more little piece of rust right here. We'll drag this into the center point. Just a little piece of this right, right down in here. Just a little piece of that curve option we'll just go ahead and add the mask and paint again with white and this is the last one we'll bring in of the rusty metal so we'll just kind of bring in a little more there we go there we go I'm so it's looking pretty good I'm finding I'm happy with the way this kind of thing is looking we need something a little weird going on here so I thought something happened after I done did this and looked at it for a week or two I decided oh I'm gonna put some fire in here see what else it's like like the furnace hard-working labor hands it could be an illustration for an annual report on labor or and just about a lot of different different things I'm gonna go open up a shot of flame this is a nice little lesson about fire how did I shoot this fire Sim very simple worked against just set up some black a black background some black felt I laid out a, in working in a dark room I laid out a, a big couple of piece, a big piece of two by four across the table I used a little flammable liquid probably a little bestine or lighter fluid and just put a stream of, of line down the two by four Everything was pre-focused on the two by four. Had my exposure set for about one second. Shorter than one second, the fire is too sharp. Longer than one second, you're going to get a sloppy fire. You have to find out what works good for you. But one second for me worked really nice to give me a nice moving flame. Now the flame, of course, is on a black background. Am I going to use a pen tool to cut this out? No, of course not. We'll use a blend mode. We'll make a blend. There's got to be a blend mode in here that's going to work. So we're going to drag our fire in here. And I say I like what's going on here, but it's a little bit too small. So I'll do a Command T, and I'm going to stretch that out a little bit. I'm not holding any Shift key down this time. I'm keeping it. I'm not worried about constraints. I want to at least get at least half that shot. Now, since it's it's kind of cool, why don't we just duplicate? Why don't we just take this, and uh, we can duplicate it. This is a very easy way to do that. I'm on the layer of the fire over here. You can see in the layers panel. If I'm in the Move tool, I can hold my Option key and my shift key and just drag this guy duplicates the layer and makes me a second one very nice I'm gonna change the blend mode to my favorite fire blend mode is going to be screen and I'll change that for both of them and you can see here now we've got this nice kinda of cool little fire and we would get of course uh, because I want to have time for just one more quick deal over this thing we would probably take this one more time into uh, let me save this to the desktop as the uh, chains the final uh, and that way I can flatten it let's just go ahead we got to put a little quick edge or something on here um, so I of course saved all the layer files let's look at what we have all together started out with the background shot we added an extra little frame in here we um, added the hands and brushed those in with the displacement mapping then we added each one of these smaller little uh, rusty things in here as we see fit we can of course change you know any one of these seem like they're too strong you can play with it forever and start taking out some of the opacity so you can see a little more see-through which is sometimes fun too because that way we are um, right maybe right in here a little bit down so you can start seeing the chain through there and of course then we added our two fire layers and these are both in the screen blend mode made the uh, black drop out and um, the um, excuse me the black drop out and just leave our fires now if you wanted to we could put a white border on here and add another frame around the outer edge but you know that's I want to make sure I have just a few more minutes to show you I want to review the displacement mapping one more time just on the displacement mapping so that you can get a feel for that plus it'll make sense when you uh, go and download the extra PDF file so uh, that's saved and I, th I think that turned out pretty good I'm, I'm not too unhappy with the way that looks uh, now what we could also do is take a flattened version of that and punch it up you know we do have to, we just have to sorry we got to do this so we save the layered version I got a, I got a thought here flatten image 
I just remembered one thing that just would really make it look just kick because it's a little weak right here is go back into photo tools and go into my image optimization and do my favorite daily multiple vitamin thing there we go I like that and if I like something there we go a couple things just added a dark and tonal range and daily multiple vitamins hit apply and of course now now we're talking get a little more kick to the thing um, of course we there we go there we now we're talking let's just get F F and a little bigger there we go now we're talking and I like that it's got a little more punch now and you can see how the the black around the hands gives it that third dimension we're trying to create some dim third dimensions we've used the frames we've used the photo tools we've we've used only a few items but we've created a really collage and we've used a lot of different effects with a lot with these blend modes and these this thing says, well, yeah, it works great, but I don't have to do bricks on a hand. I tell you where this comes in. If you have to colorize clothing, you got a portrait you're doing and they're wearing the wrong clothes, you just select the clothing, take out the color that's there, and add, a, a, just like I added the shot, you can add a color. Just same three blend modes, 50% each, color, overlay, multiply, and it is absolutely the very best prototyping, matching exact Pantone colors. Uh, and I do this all the time for my still life photography and product photography. So uh, let's go ahead and we'll drop that. I wanted to say that I can real quickly just do one more, one more, one more displacement mapping. We're not going to go through all the other elements, but this is one that's uh, it was a cover for Photoshop User Magazine. So we'll just go through the steps one more time, real simply. We'll open the head, and I'm going to make a, blur, a black and white shot again. We'll go uh, to the fill for this one, a filter. We'll do on one. We know. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. With on one, new Nick, uh, on one, right? On one. No, I can't get it right here. Where is this? I'm sorry. Got to go back to my tools. I don't have them down where they need them. They're over here. Uh, I need them here. Um, sorry, photo tools, and uh, we will do. Um, we will do the black and white. Sorry, photo tools. Here we go. Launching tools. Uh, here we go. Photo tools, and down at the bottom. We'll go to uh, no, actually it's up top here. Uh, black and white treatments, and I like the I like that same one I used before. There we go. I like that black and white. Hit apply. Now we'll save. We're going to apply a slight blur to that. Command E, it's two layers over here. Command E or Control E will merge that layer down. Uh, we'll take that image and we will blur it. Blur, Gaussian blur. So, so much, take that, and I will save that command uh, shift S or control shift S. I'm saving it to the desktop as head on rust. And I, I usually try to call this one the source because it looks for a source of S O U R C E. Sort, put space there, source file. So head on rust, not a JPEG, but a, of course, PSD to the desktop. Hit save. Close that off. Then we'll get the original head back. Let's take our nice little, I like this one because it really shows off the effect really well. You can see here we have lights and darks on this head and how the crevice goes down into the shadow. If you look on this head here, you can see how it goes down in, a sh it goes down in the shadow and up and down in the shadow and up and has to curve around the nose so you can really see some things going on here. So we, and I like the straight lines because you can really see the lines bend. I'm going to drag this over. Hit five for fifty percent, and we will now shrink it. Command T or Control T for free transform. Hold my Shift and Option, to make it smaller, just a little bit bigger than the head. Shift and Option, Shift and Alt on the PC. Hit OK. Now I know it's in the right spot. Hit that filter. Filter, distort, displace. It's already set for 3030. 30. It's looking for a picture. We don't want to give it the change. We give it the new head on rust. The the, the picture of that out that out of focus black and white mannequin head with the lights and darks will tell this circuit board how to bend. And if I blow that up a little bigger, you can really see it. This is where you can really see it happen here. Especially look at the top of the head here as I do Command Z. Command Z, you can see how it literally drops into the crevice and bends around the nose and around the lips. And to get the real realistic part, of course, all we have to do is cut off the excess part. Now, I already have a path cut, so we don't have to wait for that. So I'm going to hold down my Command key, the Control key on the PC, 
Command click that path, so now we have a selection around that. I always, whenever I make a path or, or any kind of, sorry, any kind of selection, turning into a path turning into selection, I always want to refine that edge and give it at least three tenths of a pixel. I want to give it, it gives it a slight aliased edge so it's not like a razor blade cut sh sharp. So that's all I'm going to do is a standard operation, three tenths of a pixel. On that layer, if I hold with that selection there, if I click on that layer with the new uh, layer mask, boom, it dropped everything else out onto the mask automatically for me. You can or you don't have to keep it. You can, if you want to be some reason, you might want to keep that. But to keep things simple in your head, I'm just going to really just go ahead and apply that mask and say apply. So now what do we have? We have this, uh, if I bring it up to 100%, we have this pure green, slightly distorted head of circuit board on top of the head, and as I change that to 50%, that's, eh, you know, in a dark room, that's all we could do is really apply it. But with displacement met with the uh, blend modes, I can change that. Of course, first one, the bottom one, multiply, and it's about 50%. Duplicate it. Middle one goes to overlay. Boom. And then you duplicate it again, and then the top one goes to color. Boom. And if you go in here nice and close, you can see how it really takes that yellow line, follows the brightness, and then as it gets into the, the it depends on how dark the crevice is. If the crevice is really dark, this is a better example, if the crevice is really dark, the yellow and the green got darker with it. So you can see how, if I just hold down my option key and click that, you can see how I can still see all the texture of that original piece, but I can also have all the new texture of the incoming piece too. So it really gives us a uh, a lot of up. Uh, oh, didn't get them all on. You can see multiply, and again, once I get all three on, multiply stronger, multiply less. I have lots of different options, uh, but you'll find that around 50% is going to be about where we need to be. I'm finishing really close to being on time here. I'd like to just bring a couple of things to your attention uh, that I have going on. Um, so you can have some notes here. If I do Command All and Command L, um, I have a special download sheet which you can download as a PDF that then will link you to other PDFs. So that instead of me trying to figure tell you all the different PDFs by name, I've given you a super cheat sheet for everything I know. And keep this address because about once every six months, I'll probably be upgrading these addresses. It'll have the same download.zip address, but the download will be different. I'll just use the same address. And as I come up with new blog posts and new uh, and new tutorial articles or anything that I want to share with you, I will put that on there as a link so that you don't have to keep saying, well, I know I saw you do this, but I forget where to get it. On this one, you are going to, once you click that, you will go to a, this is a link, and there's one here uh, called, uh, I've designed it, it's down here somewhere, it's, uh, it's called Displace, oh, here it is, right here on top, Displacement Mapping. If you click on this link, it's going to download a uh, PDF of an article that I did uh, many, many years ago, step-by-step -step stuff that I did for Photoshop user, it's going to download some of that information for you so that you can follow along and practice. And please send me some pictures. I'd love to see what you're doing with all that. A lot of people have been sending me their examples. Uh, I do have a digital imaging blog, the tune up, uh, call it uh, the Digital Imaging Tune Up Clinic. Uh, I am on the Facebook blog network. I'm so proud to say that I have the highest readership number in the world for the keywords of Photoshop, digital photography, and digital imaging on the Facebook blog network. Uh, I'm sure there are other bigger blogs, but I have a really big following of thousands of people, and I put a lot of really cool tutorial information up here, and especially about where I'm speaking and about these webinars that we do, thanks to On One. All those things will be listed here, so please do not hesitate to visit. I would love for you to be a follower of my blog, so to do that, just look me up on Facebook and send me a Facebook friend invitation, and then I will send you back an invitation to be a follower of my blog. Um, you will find my blog and, of course, my website is divitalliphotography.com. And from the splash page, you can load, you can launch into my blog or launch into my website. I do have a fine art website, and I also have a uh, online portfolio with Foundfolio. Uh, if you're interested in any of the training stuff, I have a full, brand new set of classes with uh, Kelby Training. 
Uh, so those of you who are members of Kelby Training, check out my new uh, photo in the studio. They film me down in Tampa at the studio doing all kinds of things. And I'm getting ready to lay down a bunch of new tracks using On One software and all these plugins. I'm going to do a whole new creative track coming up uh, that will see a lot more usage of the On One techniques and products in the upcoming uh, Kelby movies for Photoshop. And last but not least, uh, we have announced once in a very blue moon, I will do a hands-on workshop for a small group of people here at our Atlanta facilities. My wife, Helene, who is also a Photoshop World instructor, uh, we're the only husband and wife Photoshop World instructors on the team. And she teaches portraiture and posing and all kinds of really cool stuff. Her, of course, she's more in the portrait side, I'm in the commercial side. So two days with us is like six weeks in college, we will give you the best of both worlds from color management to uh, montaging and everything in between. So if you're interested, go to my blog. There's information all about it, and you can email me with any questions you might have. Uh, I'm Brian. I want to thank On One for the opportunity to let me reach out to so many people. And uh, please don't hesitate to send questions. Or some, A lot of people have been sending their photographs in and getting me to critique them and help them along. So if you try displacement mapping and you get stuck, do not hesitate to email me. You can contact me directly from the website. And uh, this, hopefully, webinar will be up online uh, in the very near future with uh, uh, the On One University archives with uh, some of the others that Brian has been doing some fabulous webinars on all the different softwares and especially that HDR stuff that he does, all that great architecture. So go back there and check out these webinars because it's an absolute wealth of free downloadable imaging information that takes you not just with on one but all over the photography world. So